thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it for, for having this conversation. Um, the one obvious question that comes to my mind um, when I ha think of starting a conversation with you is your life story. <laughs> um, it's a fascinating journey into your current role, but there's so much more to it than that. So please tell us, um, how did you get here and uh, what are some of the things that you've learned along the way? Well, my story is not amazing in any way really. It's quite a simple and humble uh, kind of background. Uh, I was born to Kashmiri immigrant family uh, in the 1960s. My parents were never touched by the magic wand of an education in any culture or language, so they couldn't read or write. So a very simple family, humble background in inner city Birmingham. I grew up in a part of the country where uh, uh, it was the most deprived then, it's probably even more deprived uh, now than it's ever been, yet it's had more regeneration done to it than most places. Mm -hmm. But that's just a, you know, a, a kind of side issue of how communities survive and thrive mm -hmm. in really difficult circumstances. And I say that because that's a really important part of my DNA, of who I am now, what makes me tick, mm -hmm. why I do the work I do. Mm -hmm. It goes all the way back to my childhood of understanding mm -hmm. how important the basics are in life. You know, when you have to mm -hmm. read and write for your parents, mm -hmm. whether it's a doctor's note, yeah. or you know some other kind of official derm or something or forging the signatures on your own school reports yeah. because there's no point giving it to your parents yeah. that kind of thing. and but that teaches you a lot and mm. about value mm. what really matters mm. and what really matters is love care and attention mm. i think to yourself and to other people and those around you and it's not about materialism mm. you know it's not about glory or fame or anything like that mm. and those kind of values have stuck with me throughout my career, which is now into its 35th year. So I began life as a maths teacher, would you believe? Yeah, and that was really scary. because uh, <laughs> I was not much good at anything else. You know, I had a brilliant maths teacher at school so you inspired. who inspired me, yeah. inspired me, caught me before I fell. Yeah. I never understood why he was so interested in somebody so insignificant in his class, <laughs> but he showed real care and compassion and inspired me not only to study the subject, but then to go on and teach it. Mm. And so I was very happy as a maths teacher, actually, mm. and feel quite privileged to have a job mm. because the background I came from, you know, mm. most people were unemployed. So that was a, you know, great for me. And I thought, I don't want to do anything else. And then I'm a great believer in, uh, I mean, I'm a spiritual person. I believe mm. in destiny. Mm -hmm. right? And my own moral on this is that be grateful for what the Almighty has given you on any one day, mm. put in 110% into mm. those opportunities and don't worry at all about tomorrow because you're not in your control anyway. And that's how I've lived my professional life. So as a teacher, that's all I wanted to do. Right. But opportunities came and I volunteered a lot and I did extra and I wanted to learn and I had this hunger. And so I was really keen to develop you know, myself in all sorts of other ways. So I was a community activist alongside my professional work. I used to be out street on campaigns in streets, you know, arguing for social justice. Mm -hmm. Again, connected back to my history, my own childhood and so on, you know, understanding the value of basic services mm -hmm. for people. And then opportunities came my way and made rapid progress to the education system, ended up being an assistant principal of a large mm -hmm. further education college. Uh, and then I got my big break, mm -hmm. if you like, and completely unexpectedly when I became an assistant director of education mm -hmm. in Birmingham City Council. Right. The one up organization as a resident of Birmingham I used to campaign against okay. and say it was a, there was a lot of waste there was a lot of you know kind of um, yeah. inefficiencies so moved on to the other side. and I went and started yeah. working there but I went there because I was inspired by the director of education there a guy called Professor Tim Brighouse yeah. who was a larger than life character one of yeah. the most inspiring individuals you could ever work for yeah. and he's still my mentor yeah. to this day he's long retired and I was suddenly thrown into this big uh, ocean of responsibility, 3,000 staff, a 50 million pound budget, this is like 20 years ago, and I was the youngest assistant director that I'd ever appointed, and one of the few non-white mm. people there as well. But I really reveled in that role, did it for three and a half years, and then completely unexpectedly got appointed as director of education in a London borough. Uh, so moved the family here and so on, and that was the epitome of my career, basically. Being yeah. an educationist, I thought there's nothing better yeah. than this. Yeah. I could do this for the next 30 years. It was yeah. that satisfying, tough, yeah. really tough, but uh, a huge amount of you know, personal satisfaction of trying to touch the lives through education mm. of hundreds of thousands mm. of young people. You were seriously making a difference <clears throat> in that. I, well, I, I, you know, yeah. I'd, like to think, yeah. I'd like to think I was, but it was a great, great you know, privileged yeah. opportunity. And, and of course, like, 
like most people, you know, after a while you begin to think, well, actually, maybe there's other things mm. I could do as well. And other people started telling me mm. there are other things mm. I could do. And then I did a stint in central government as an executive director working on serious youth violence, would you believe? Very hairy and scary responsibility. Mm. Yeah. We got close to the, the um, impact mm. of violent crime, not only those who are the victims, but also the perpetrator and their family and the, the dent that does to people's, literally to their life chances in a range of ways and made my contribution there and then um, got persuaded to enter the voluntary sector completely unexpectedly not part of a career trajectory i don't believe in those things anyway personally there's no career plan but then uh, we became chief executive for the first time in 2010 at victim support which is a fantastic mm -hmm. uh, ngo working across england and wales and three and a half years into that again i could have stayed there through to retirement but then bernardo's came knocking on the door mm -hmm. where i am now in my sixth year and this was completely irresistible. I needed no persuasion. Mm. Uh, I got appointed and six years in now, mm. it feels like day one, literally. Yeah. That's the buzz that I get from coming mm. here. And the reason is, is because it's a cause. Mm. This isn't a job. Mm. And I do what I do because I want to transform the lives of vulnerable children. It sounds like a bit of a cliche, mm. but actually that's what Bernardo's does on the scale that we do it. And I feel privileged and humbled to be here. I mean, you talked about the bus that you get. It's so obvious from walking into this office, uh, mm. you know, what you've created, uh, what's in your head is what mm. you've created outside. You're solving a very complex problem in, in mm. the world, in the country, you know. How, um, how do you go about it? You know, um, what are some of the leadership challenges that come with it? And how mm. do you... How do you keep yourself going and how do you overcome some of them? Mm, mm. I mean, we at Common Purpose, we talk about we help leaders solve conflict mm. problems, but my God, what you're doing is pretty, <laughs> pretty incredible. Yeah, I, I think you're right. You know, this is very, very complex because the plight mm. of vulnerable children and young people, uh, and these are kids mm. that, you know, I often travel around the world and talk about Bernardo's and people can't understand how the sixth largest economy in the world could have four and a half million children living in poverty yeah. as we speak and those numbers are rising yeah. and if some of the politics doesn't go well in the next year or two those numbers are going to rising. be dramatically yeah. rising yeah. we live in a country where one in eight children in every classroom has a mental health issue often undiagnosed and unsupported uh, one in four 14 year old girls is exhibiting social anxiety in this country right now in terms of poverty, you know, those four and a half million I'm talking about, 62% of those families that those kids live in are in work. Mm. It's not like they're lazy. Mm. They're underemployed. So apparently, it's, it probably looks S Superficially, okay, it looks fine. It's not, yeah. So, and those are just some of the headline statistics. And it gets much, much worse when you mm. begin to think about child sexual abuse, mm. exploitation, grooming, mm. whether it's online or on streets, mm. disabilities, mm. broader mental health issues. Uh, family breakdowns, drugs, alcohol, abuse, misuse. Mm. Uh, it is hairy and scary. You know? it is, I mean, I still, to mm. this day, when I go and visit our services, which I do regularly to keep my finger on the pulse, you know, a, a tear comes to my eye. You know, I need to take a handkerchief with me. That's how hard it hits. And I would challenge anybody to come into our services and not be affected in that way. So it is hugely complex. Where do you start? Mm. Where are the right interventions? What is going mm. to work? Hmm. which are the contributing organizations to really make that difference hmm. how do you measure and track hmm. the impact and it is a long game hmm. you can't there's no magic hmm. wand there that can no be solved yeah. however having said that bernardo's is 153 years old we've been around a long time hmm. <clears throat> and a lot has been learned over those many many decades about what does work and because of the scale that yeah. we operate at yeah. supporting over 300,000 beneficiaries every year and raising lots of money, the great British public is very generous and supports us. And so do the government and local government and so on. So we've learned a lot about what are the interventions that make a difference. But for Bernardo's, you know, it isn't just about hands-on support for mm. the individual. It's very, very important. That's what people need. That's what we're mm. very skilled at. Mm. But it's also about capturing the evidence mm. on a large scale mm. about what is working, mm. taking that evidence mm. to the powers that be. Mm. So I'm in and out of Westminster all the mm. time, speaking to ministers and secretaries of state and shadow ministers and influencing mm. government at the highest level mm. so that tomorrow's policy agenda is, is developed and defined in a way that is based on the hard evidence that Bernardo's can bring about what is working and what isn't. Right. So, so it starts from the, you know, somebody's referred to us yeah. and we provide local project workers and local uh, services on, in mm. local communities, employing local people 
uh, and capturing that evidence and taking it to yeah. the government at the highest level to influence the legislation. Now, in our 150th anniversary, I was invited to do a, an alumni lecture at my own old university on a topic of my choice, and I spoke about the 150 years of Bernardo's. Oh, right. And we did some detailed research over that time and identified 12 specific instances over those years where Bernardo did exactly what I'm talking about, spotted a need, delivered services, yeah. captured the evidence, took it to government, and, and changed, changed legislation the, yeah. as a result, including elements of the Children's Act, yeah. for example, directly connected to Bernardo's intervention. So this is a huge legacy. Yeah. Uh, you know, I often say I'm walking in the shadows of giants before me. <laughs> Literally, that's how it yeah. feels. And it's a hugely privileged position, but a great responsibility as well yeah. to speak up, being bold, being brave on behalf of those who often have nobody else to speak and for them. And taking risks, you know. They hold taking like enormous risks you, yeah, along the way, yeah. calculated risks, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, this isn't the kind of risk around safeguarding, because we're yeah. a safeguarding organization, but being bold and brave to do what others... To do the right thing. Sometimes haven't got the resources to do, haven't yeah. spotted the need to do, to test out tomorrow's best practice yeah. so that we can improve yeah. Yeah. the country. As you've been talking about your kind of, you know, whole approach to trying to solve this complex problem at different levels. The thing that strikes me, um, Javed, which is, it's, it's, it's absolutely there, and it's kind of there in your life story, not just in your current role, is you've constantly been crossing boundaries, you know, and you've constantly been trying to figure out how do you kind of cross the boundary in order mm. to connect with another culture mm. or mm. a very different way of working. How do you do that? I mean, we would call that cultural intelligence in common <laughs> purpose, the ability yeah. to cross boundaries and thrive in multi multiple mm. cultures, not just survive, mm. but mm. thrive. Mm. How do you do it? You, it feels like something that, I, I dare say, you make it sound very easy. I know it's not. Mm. But there's something here about your approach, your way of working, mm. your way of thinking, what matters to you, things mm. that matter to you that make it possible for you to achieve what you're achieving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. I think there's something uh, to learn. It's a mi mi mixture of things, and I, I, and I don't take credit for most of them, because you know I think they're lear it's learned behavior from others as well, and really being committed and disciplined to wanting to learn mm. from other people around you. So I've had enormous privileges over the years mm. of coming into contact, rubbing shoulders with, uh, reporting to yeah. some amazingly skilled people, mm. and I've taken the best of what I've seen from mm. all of those people and then try to mm. you know, reproduce it in my, in my own way. But I, I think fundamentally at, my, at the core of my own journey mm. has been this bold mm. approach mm. to life and to the career and be, being prepared to take risks. Mm. So my career history, I've changed my job, literally mm. profession if you like, mm. seven times. Mm. Not a lot of people do that I think mm. when, you, when, you, when, I, when I talk mm. to colleagues, seven times I've switched. Mm and done something different. You reinvented yourself. Reinvented myself. Yeah. And each one of those reinventions is really hard to yeah, do. That's and that's why most people don't do it. Yeah. They, they get comfortable and they stick with what they know. Yeah. And I haven't done that. And I've learned a great deal from that. It's, some of it's been painful learning. I've got it wrong. I've made enormous mistakes. You know, I've got the bruises and mm -hmm. so on. I read a fantastic book once, uh, which I've given away as I often do, and I never get it back. And it doesn't matter. Somebody else is learning from it. But the opening chapter of the book starts with, why is it every time I get stabbed in the back, it's my fingerprints on the knife? Mm. It's worth thinking about, isn't it? Mm. We, we often, stuff happens to us mm. in our careers, mm. and we're very quick to see well, who did what to us, mm. right? mm. who, who inflicted this pain on us. Yeah. And the last person, if ever we think of, exactly. is what was our contribution yeah. to, it. to it. So I'm a firm believer in... Whatever we do and happens, our own fingerprints are on there and we may are probably the greatest contributors mm. to it. Mm. And so I've held on to that. Mm. And, that, and that comes back to my spirituality of this great belief of, you know, whatever I'm going to try and do, the outcome is not in my control. Mm. Mm. The, all I can control is the input that mm. I'm putting into it and my 110%. Mm. And so I think that's permeated some of what you're right. talking about, you right. know, that I believed that yeah. if it's meant for me, it will yeah. come and if it isn't, mm. it won't. And it was never meant for me. Anyway, yeah, yeah. so I, there's yeah. no point getting down about it. So I've taken risks yeah. because of that. Some of the things I've learned along the way, though, is the flexibility and the adaptability that is required mm. to be able to transcend mm. those boundaries. key challenges, those yeah. boundaries yeah. that have come my way. And I've had some knockbacks along the way. I mean, some of the jobs I never got, mm. I remember you know, I really wanted them. Mm. But if I had got them, mm. I wouldn't be sitting here today mm. talking to you. Mm. wouldn't have the privilege of what I'm doing because I'd be 
mm. in that place, I think. So that's taught me a lot. And I often share this with other colleagues that don't get despondent about the knockbacks that you get. Mm. Maybe the very best thing that's ever happened to you actually to mm. not get that job that you were mm. desperate to get. But the one you do get, put in 110%. Mm. Be brave, be bold, volunteer, go beyond the job description that you've been given. Develop your networks, hunt out your mentors, hold on to them. Don't let go of them because they're the people that you're going to learn most, most from. from yeah. Reading, writing and all of that stuff comes with it. You yeah. know, spending time with people of common purpose <laughs> is a great privilege because I always come back enthused and it's an adrenaline boost. Thank you. <laughs> because that's how it feels. Yeah. But if I wasn't making the effort and I, when, you, when you come to me and ask me to do something, I think, oh, well, that feels like hard work. Let me just go for the easy option. I wouldn't learn. Yeah. I wouldn't rub shoulders with those people. And that's where my learning has come from, mm. really. Mm. We, you know, we call it cultural competence. I think it's a great phrase, actually. Mm. That's the way that people mm. need to be thinking about it. Mm. Within it is emotional mm. intelligence. Mm. You know, it's not academic. Mm. Right? It's practical. It's, mm. it's learned behavior. But it's also brave, bold, being, having empathy with a whole range of people. Mm. I think critically in 2020 Britain, 2020 urban environments all over the world, I think cultural competence mm. is critical mm. to the future prosperity of big urban environments. You know, if mm. we don't focus on it, yeah. I, I think we're all going to find it very difficult. Yeah. You mentioned, um, and you've made so many transitions in your life. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we, you talked about reinventing. You made so many transitions in your life. But the one thing you've consistently <coughs> done as part of that transition feeds to me hearing you share what you're sharing is you've constantly pushed yourself to learn hmm. and you've constantly pushed yourself to be flexible and to yeah. adapt quickly. So that kind of agility, that sort yeah. of being open to be more inclusive, to serve your teams better, hmm. to serve your communities better. How do you do it? Give hmm. me, tell me something that gives us, the rest of us hope to be able to, to, be able so, to do so that I, as well. So I'd say the, the question before that should be why do you do it? Yeah. Right? And that's where my, my kind of drive yeah, comes from. Right. The reason right. I it's do the it. It's a right? purpose. It's a purpose. It comes yeah. back to purpose. You yeah. know? Yeah. People say, what's it like running Bernardo's, you know, the largest children's charity in the universe, as it were. <laughs> and I say, actually, firstly, it's not a job. Yeah. This is a cause. Yeah. This literally is a cause. And most of the things that I've done in, in my career, it's probably all of them, in fact, mm. are cause-driven. Mm. Whether it was teaching uh, young people to get excited about fractions <laughs> and algebra, was a cause. I'm glad I wasn't right? you know, you know, you a, I'm sure you had a bad maths teacher, it's not you. No, that's true. It's that's not you. True. Right? Bad maths teachers should be held to account. But you can excite people mm. about the most mundane yeah. things that in the past they've been quite scared about. Yeah. And anyway, if you, if you see it as a cause, if you see it as a contribution to society, mm. you know, there's a phrase of sadka. Yeah. You know, you heard that? Yes, yeah. seva. Yeah, seva. Right? In, in the Asian yeah. community, yeah. All of, that's what it is. Yeah. That's what teaching is. I've always viewed it as that. Mm. This is your contribution to societal development. And everything I've done since then, mm. in my work through education and now in the voluntary sector, there is no greater form of seva, sadka, karma, all of that. Mm. But this is it. This is what it is about. And when you can connect your mind, body and soul to that kind of cause, I think firstly you're hugely privileged to mm. find yourself in that position. Mm. But in terms of a, a driver for the 80, 90 hours a week that you might be putting into it, mm. actually it becomes no longer becomes a challenge. It's not a problem. It's not a, you know, an issue for you. Your blend for your private, personal and work life is seamless. The why and the what. Yeah, because the why it merges. Yeah. It merges. And yeah. that's where I get it from. That's where I get my yeah. drive from. Yeah. That's why I say it feels like day one. Yeah. Uh, I have to pinch myself to say, how blessed am I yeah. to do this yeah. kind of work? And if I ever need a reminder, yeah. I just go and visit a service and yeah. spend time with some of the children and their families, those that are fortunate to still have families, because many of them aren't. Yeah. And I come back completely, you know, focused. No, it resonates with me a lot, uh, David, because a lot of people, you know, when I look at my nieces and nephews and they look at me and say, oh, you've worked with an organization for 19 years, they think <laughs> I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> but if, that, it keep, if it keeps you going yeah. because of the why, then yeah. 19 years... And what you will have done in your 19 years is not done the same job no, in the same way, of course. Yeah. You replenished. But, yeah, you? but the why yeah. has always been. The why is constant. You know, you get disenchanted along the way for yeah. many different reasons, but you never get disenchanted with the purpose. Yeah. yeah. So there's one sort of question that, that I can't not ask um, mm. before we close this amazing conversation is, as you look to the future, 
And I feel uh, very excited about asking you this because you are working with young people. Mm. You're so lucky you're connected with the, mm. with the next generation of the future. So as you look to the future, what do you think are some of the skills that will be needed to cope with this, as everybody's been describing it, this VUCA world, you know, volatile, mm. uncertain, complex, ambiguous. What do you think? And do you, do you live in hope? Or do, do, does mm. it give you hope that we've got the next generation with the right sort of mindset yeah. and skills to be able to do so, that? I mean, the challenge is enormous. It's not, you know, underestimated. But I live with great hope, mm. actually, for many, many reasons. I'll just give you an example. Just last week, mm. I was handing out awards mm. to young people. Mm. And there was a young, young man who's paraplegic mm. in a wheelchair. Mm. All he can do is move the controls of his wheelchair to move them around. Mm. And he was uh, a young volunteer of the year mm. award. He's at university. He came through Bernardo Services, mm. through Disability Services. He's at university now, has won awards at his university for best student of the year, kind of thing, and we've given him an award because he's come back and volunteered in helping other young people. But if you saw him physically, you would think he's not capable of doing anything. Mm -hmm. But his mind and his brain is completely engaged. You cannot walk away from that without hope mm -hmm. about what is possible in this complex, mm -hmm. you know, challenging world that we live in, mm -hmm. where we often sometimes think there is no hope, but there is hope. Mm -hmm. There are lots of people, young people, who are committed. I mean, you just look at Greta Thunberg yeah. and the work that she's done yeah. as a 16-year-old with Asperger's syndrome, is, yeah. right? Who has transformed young people's view of what contribution they can make. Yeah. And there are many, many others like that in this country and other countries. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the key thing, key message for me is for, uh, for us, who are the guardians of systems at yeah. the moment for those young people, yeah. firstly, remember the future is in their hands. Yeah. Not us. We were going to be dependent and reliant upon them before we know it. Yeah. So it's in our interest to invest in them. And one of the key things that we need to invest is develop their resilience. Because yeah. that's going to be the key test, I think, in the future. Because it's going if, to be tough. It's going to get tougher. Yeah. It is going to get tougher. And whether you, you know, think of the trajectory of the digital world, for example, is going to be beyond our imagination. You mm. just think 10, 15 years ago, mm. social media in the way we know it now didn't exist. Mm. Twitter and Facebook mm. and so on. What is it going to look like in 15 years' time? It is unpredictable. Mm. You know, it's going at a kind of you know, a rate of progress mm. that nobody can keep a grip of. That's the world they're going to be living in. I was talking to my children. I've got four daughters myself, and a 17-year-old is really keen mm. to start driving lessons. And I said to her, she's got a provisional license, and I said, you know, realize in your lifetime, you're not going to need to drive. Yeah. And she said, what do you mean? You all drive. I said, yeah. The driverless nice cars, cars are coming. Yeah. Driverless cars. You'll press a button, it'll pick you up, it'll drop you off what you want, and there'll be no driver. Yeah. So your license is going to be useless, yeah. actually. Hmm. And so that's the world we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, add to it this kind of global village kind of challenge. Uh, urban environments are going to change beyond any kind of recognition that we could have of them. The cultural mix mm. and heritages and the future that that is going to mm. you know, bring, the, the importance of cultural intelligence Absolutely. for young people to be able to operate mm. in that constantly changing mm. and challenging environment where cultural nuances mm. are going to be far more extreme than mm. they have ever been. And it won't be, they won't be very visible. Something they won't be visible, visible. No, no, completely. It'll hit completely them right. before they know it. It will hit them. So we need to invest in their learning in that way for that kind of world, one that we mm. won't be the guardians mm. any longer for. But we'll still be dependent if we're around mm. on how well they're going to do it. Now, I have great hope, I think, mm. because I spend a lot of time with young people. And I, you know, as I say, when I spend time with vulnerable young people, mm whose aspirations for the future mm. are just as valid and determined and well thought through as those who aren't vulnerable. Mm. I think, wow, you know, the future is actually exciting. Mm. And as long as we do in our roles and responsibilities, mm. do what we can our level best to prepare the ground for them, mm. they will seize it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Javed. I feel like I've not just spoken to a chief executive of a charity that's doing amazing work. I've spoken to one of the most amazing learners in the <laughs> world who's constantly introspecting and thinking about how to push um, his own boundaries mm. of learning as you go around crossing um, it's very other kind boundaries. Of you. Uh, in the I mean, on the learning, if I can just end with one quote, which is you sure. know, in, imprinted Please. deep inside me. There's a guy called Eric Hoffer, yeah. uh, American mm -hmm. management guru, and he wrote in one of his books a long time ago, but it's a, it's a fantastic phrase. He says that in a world of constant change, mm. It is the learners who will inherit the earth, whilst the learned will remain beautifully equipped to live in a world that no longer exists.
Right. I think we all need to hold on to that. No, no, absolutely. Very powerful, very powerful. Thank you so much. And, and the thoughts that you've shared on kind of, you know, the need for agility, empathy, mm. it's hit me really hard. And and the resilience point, absolutely. I think we all have a responsibility to yeah. make sure that <clears throat> those sorts of skills are something that we are constantly conscious of mm. as we work with the next generation and, and uh, more. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Really appreciate it. Thank you.